Good morning, and welcome to worship, everyone, and thank you for our musicians today for bringing us into worship. Well, a few announcements to highlight. A uh, special welcome if you are new to this place or if you are visiting. It's a gift that we are brought together in this unique setting, because never again will this exact group of people be sitting in this exact room, and so our experience is special today, I am grateful. Um, for everyone who's joining online, uh, welcome to you today as well. As we celebrate our nation's Independence Day, we'll be praying for our country and for the world in the prayers, and you'll hear some of our national and world songs today as we celebrate our independence and our interdependence with the world. This week, we are hosting Church on the Street. And if you have never heard of Church on the Street, it is one of our partner ministries um, that is a congregation that we've helped develop in downtown Sioux Falls that is primarily working with people who are dealing with home challenges as far as homelessness and housing instability. So each Saturday morning, um, we meet in the park, and it's a beautiful worship service. And so our congregation is one of the hosts this week. Um, at 11 o'clock at Heritage Park. If you'd like to find out more on the, the counter in the gathering space, there's the sheet about this ministry. And I do invite you, um, because I think there's going to be a tremendous sermon this Saturday, um, but I haven't written it yet. <laughs> I'm a guest preacher, so for good or ill, you can come for that. There is a sign-up on that table as well. I appreciate sign-ups, so we could anticipate how many people there's usually a couple other worshipers. The month of July, our partner emphasis is on Lutheran disaster response. And we've been praying for the folks down in Florida in the process of sorting through that rubble in the high-rise collapse there. Lutheran disaster response is on the scene anytime there's a major disaster in the country and throughout the world. So our global offering today and throughout the month will be going to disaster response efforts. We are having um, cake and bars and coffee following worship, and we have some cake that is left from Darlene Tangemeyer's 91st birthday party this week. So thank you for all the organizers for that party. It was a delight and a pleasure to be together and to celebrate with her. And you can remember her with a piece of cake today as well. So that will be in the fellowship hall for, um, for a time of fellowship after worship. Today, we are concluding the sermon series on 2 Corinthians, about this small Christian community in the city of Corinth 2,000 years ago that echoes through to our days today. And so today, we'll hear about a word that is core to who we are as Lutherans. It's the word of grace, and that God's grace is sufficient for us. Our worship continues with our opening song. I'll invite you to stand as we sing this is my song. Thank you. 
Sisters and brothers, bear with one another in love, maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, and take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. Holy and gracious God, we confess that we have not led a life worthy of the calling to which we have been called. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not acted according to your will. We have grieved your Holy Spirit. Have mercy on us. experiences that we rely on. 
Are they the ones where we are on an absolute spiritual mountaintop, or do they happen somewhere else? And so he begins talking about himself, that if there would be anyone who could pray. These are the words of Paul. And he begins, I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. And he's actually talking about himself. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not. God does. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast, but on my own behalf I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. But if I were to wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth, but I refrain from it, so that no one may think better of me than what is seen or heard from me even considering the exceptional character of those revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too related, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too related. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would lead me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Lord, Lord. Well, if there was ever, excuse me, I saw the look on some of your faces saying, he lost his voice. No such luck. If there was ever anyone who could boast about religious experiences, it would be this man named Paul. Because by the time he writes this letter to this group of people he loves who are kind of at each other's throats, he has been living just straightly by the Lord's hand for probably about 30 years. He could boast if he wanted to. Because some of those, what we would call spiritual experiences, are ones that are similar to ones I bet you have had. Because sometimes those experiences are just the right person showing up at the right place at the right time with the right word for him. Have you ever had one of those experiences where the right person is there exactly when you need them? Happened once at the very beginning of a giant new project. Paul finally crosses the sea and enters into Europe and he meets a woman named Lydia and opens up an entire continent because he happened to meet this one person. A spiritual, powerful experience. And then there were those that are hard to describe. I had a, one of the few sermons I can actually remember hearing as a child. I remember the minister talking about if you ever have a tremendous miracle happen to you, you may want to consider not telling about it. I thought that was so odd and very memorable. Because then he went on that some of those tremendous personal spiritual experiences, that the moment we speak them aloud, suddenly people will start wondering, well, why did that happen to you and it didn't happen to me? And he gave the advice to be careful in how we speak out on these experiences. Paul could have talked about the most powerful experiences going from the very beginning, 30 years earlier, 
when Paul had a tremendous conversion experience. One of those things where his life was totally turned from one direction to another. Literally, in Christian language, the word repentance, which in the Greek language from Scripture has a connotation of a turning of your life going from here to your life going there. Because Paul, as a young man, was an absolute persecutor of this new sect within the Jewish churches of people following Jesus as the Messiah. And it was blasphemous. And Paul, this well-trained leader, put all of his youthful, pious energy into stamping out this talk of Jesus as the Messiah. And it was right in the midst of that violent, intense time that Jesus appears to Paul. Now talk about someone who could brag about a spiritual experience, an experience that is similar to this one. It's as if he's in heaven itself. It starts to enter into those stories and experiences. You hear people seeing that, that light at the end and then coming back. But for Paul, when he experiences the presence of our Lord, he becomes blind. And the voice of Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? And this tremendously complicated series of events happen where this once proud and bold and boastful man is brought to tremendous humility, sitting in a house in a small town, blinded, as one of the followers from this little church comes in and prays on him, and he can see. And it begins a generation-long process of Paul experiencing a spiritual reality that is driving him, that is comforting him, that is providing for him in the midst of tremendous and challenging times and is gifting him with people, with congregations like in Corinth, Ephesus, Sunday school, you may have learned Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians, <coughs> and they have been blessed. And so when Paul speaks the truth in love, he looks at the people and says, if there is anyone who could be boasting about the heavens opening and great wisdom coming and, and God, God self appearing, I know someone that could do that. He's going to go like this. But he says, I will not. And in a way, he is offering an invitation about how and what to remember. An instruction as people look over their lives. What is it that we remember and how is it that we remember, especially those critical moments? Because Paul is talking about tremendous suffering. Because we, like the people in Corinth, are drawn to the idea when everything is going wonderful, that somehow we are just being enveloped and swept up in prosperous, prosperity and blessing. And then what happens when the weakness and the insults and the hardship and the persecutions and the calamities of life come? Paul says it is exactly at those places, at those weak spots, that Jesus has a door to open up into a newly imagined future that enters right into weakness. Jesus is described in various parts of the New Testament as a door. And if we think about the image of a door of opening up from one room to another, perhaps a dark room to a light room, weakness is that door that reframes what could be our most devastating moment. And it's through that 
that we will be. And the way it's described is grace is sufficient. That it's not so much me living in a way to attain just the highest mountain heights, but it's in those moments when we are completely powerless that we are changed. Where blindness becomes sight. To give an example that I find very meaningful, a friend of mine shares this every 4th of July about talking about how we remember and what we remember. My friend John is very public about talking about how difficult 4th of July is. We live in a fireworks family, and we have all kinds of family here this weekend, and we're going to shoot fireworks, and it's just delightful, and it's a great joy. And John struggles with the 4th of July because he's a Lutheran pastor, about five or six years into this process, but he's also a retired Army Airborne Combat veteran who was wounded in action, and when he hears firecrackers, his memories are drawn to firefights. And we speak about how memories come and are, are integrated as a physical experience in our bodies. If you think of those most intense moments of all of the chemicals that are happening in, in those formative times. And so, what my friend Don talks about is trying to calm make his way through the explosions the best that he can. And then he always ties it to his faith. Because Jesus came to John in his middle years. Someone who would consider himself traditionally religious, and suddenly a world opened to him when someone like Paul, just a guy, spoke good news into his explosive darkness. And his experience is the door, the door of weakness through which Jesus healed. My grace is sufficient for you. Paul, in the midst of people boasting, he says he deals with thorn in his flesh. We don't know exactly what that thorn of the flesh is. But it functions in some way to say just at that moment that he thinks he has the world by the tail, that he has everything under control. There is something that happens that brings tremendous humility and reminds him of his powerlessness. And he regrets how he boasts. He says that as followers of our Lord, it's not that we don't boast, especially about religious and spiritual experience. But what he says is this. So I will boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me through this grace, through this free presence of our living Lord, who takes a hold of us and turns us from darkness into light, who takes us from drowning to being brought upright, and shows us how to remember. Because it is through our imagination that we enter into that door to see a different future for ourselves and a different future for the world that begins in a very personal experience. And it's written about again and again and again. About a hundred years ago, uh, a minister by the name of George McDonald wrote a book called Diary of an Old Soul. And he described this experience of going through this door and having his imagination change and not just because he's ready, and he said it in this very poetic way. He says, come to me, Lord, I will not speculate how, nor will I think at which door I would have to appear, nor put off calling to my, till my floors are swept, but I cry, come, Lord, come anyway, come now. 
doors, windows, I throw wide my head, I bow, and I sit like someone who has so long slept that he knows nothing until his life draws near. This idea of awakening an imagination where the kingdom of God truly can exist, not because we have done something so well, but this kingdom of God splashes and washes upon us, and we are pushed into a new future. The novelist Solomon Rushdie described imagining our future in this way. He said, our response to the world is primarily imaginative. And I'm not saying like make-believe. It's like imagining that something could be better. That there could be a world where explosions do not bring terror. There could be a world where people are not gathering in the park because they don't have a place to live. There can be a future where people who are wracked with illness and pain can step forward in healing and in hope. Rushdie says our response to the world is primarily imaginative. Dreaming is our gift. As human beings, dreaming is a gift and it may also be our tragic flaw. And this is the point that Paul seems to be pointing out. As imaginative creatures, it is our greatest gift to have these dreams, but if our dreams are misguided and misplaced and self-focused, it can become our greatest tragic flaw and send us down paths of personal devastation and societal destruction. And yet we come together in places like this to be reminded again and again and again for our dreams to be regrounded and redirected so that we, broken though we are, the people with thorns in our very flesh, that we may step into nothing less than God's kingdom. The last shall be first, and the first shall be last. And through the presence of our Lord, all may enter. And the things that we thought made us so great, we are able to let go of. And the weakest offer the rest of the world their gift. So we say it today. We are the church. We are people who dream. We are people who are gathered simply by the grace of God. It is not in our strength that we are known, it's in our weakness that we are drawn together, so much so that we, we tell the story to the littlest ones among us like this, because these individual stories of transformation never stand alone in a vacuum. We bring them together, and that's how God works in a church. You, you know how we know that God has a sense of humor? Do you know the best that God t- could do with building a church? You see, he chose people like you. Pause for effect. He chose people like me. God builds through people, through broken, dreaming people. And we teach the children. Here's the church, here's the steeple, open the door this time, and see all the... Ah. And then we correct and say, well, this is just a building, and this is just a pointy part of the building. You want to see what the church is? It's this. It's people who have been claimed and washed and redeemed, and in our Lutheran tradition, Do you know how we define the church in our founding documents? We just say, the church is simply the place among which the good news is proclaimed and the sacraments are received. The church is simply the people who are graced by the presence of Christ. Through the presence of hearing this word together in our own unique places, in our own unique time, and receiving the bread and the wine and the water as this tremendous gift. Grace is indeed 
sufficient for us. That's who we are. That's all we are. And that's all we need. Christ coming again and again and again. So that we step on courage. Whatever your challenge is, whatever your brokenness, you are good enough, we are strong enough to pro proceed and to step into nothing less through the door that is Christ for the sake of the world. That's something to boast about. Amen. We're going to sing of this good news in a song that combines an old, beautiful song to the new hymn. Let's stand.
as we're continuing to emerge out of the pandemic. Not everyone is comfortable shaking hands, so as we share the peace, if you're comfortable shaking, if not, the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of the world. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your grace and its sufficiency among us. We pray for ears to hear your good news, to experience your presence. May you strengthen and sustain all those who proclaim in word and deed, Lord, in your mercy. We give you thanks for those who work to protect and conserve our rich and plentiful resources, give them insight and innovation as they deal with the challenge of preparing for all you have made. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you have given us, given us this good land as our heritage. Make us always remember your generosity and constantly do your will. Bless our land with honesty in the workplace, truth in education, honor in daily life. Save us from violence, discord, and confusion, from pride and arrogance, and from every evil course of action. When times are prosperous, let our hearts be thankful, and in troubled times, do not let our trust in you fail. Lord, in your mercy. We remember before you all those who carry the wounds of body and mind, for defense of this independence. Surround them with your healing. Open doors for goodness and life that we may continue to serve one another and in our weakness may strength be made known through love. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all nations for the interdependence we share and for the good of all mankind and all humankind. Lord, in your mercy. We remember before you all who are ill in the hospital or walking through challenging times. We pray for Roger Quinhane, Sharon Nelson, Stuart Franzine, Mike 
Westall, Gene and Jean Yellen, Fred Seekman, for Kevin Roth, Janice Mirmo, Sue Meyer. And we surround with prayer Magnus Henningsen as he recovers from surgery. Lord, in your mercy. We give you thanks for all the saints and those who rest in you and pray that the example of their lives might strengthen us in our own witness and service. Lord, in your mercy. Loving God, you are near to us when we cry out. Into your embrace we offer our weakness and commend all for whom we pray, that through the power of Christ and the power of your Spirit, we we may live in your name. Lord, in your mercy. We give you thanks for the words that you provided as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. Amen. Let's sing out together, number 890. We are going to have to turn to the hymnal. We don't have it on the screen. So the red hymnal in the pew. We can have a long introduction so we can find 890. 